Russian had been flying a MiG-21 on a test flight. And the, uh, had engine failure, had to bail out, landed in the North Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese uh, village, and they thought he was an American. I mean, he doesn't, doesn't look uh, Vietnamese, you know. And he doesn't speak Vietnamese. Had a flight suit on like yeah. yeah, and so they beat him up. <laughs> <laughs> so they sent the word out, you better not beat up any more Russian pilots. <laughs> also, it will be a chance to get your gentleman's autographs after the Certainly. <clears throat> One of you men mentioned you were <clears throat> going out with about a third missile dollar. Was that a logistics problem or a fiscal problem? Or both? Well, John, uh, uh, in, the, in the early days in 72, we were still carrying AIM-4, which was an old missile that uh, was, was nothing more than dead weight on the airplane. It was terribly complicated and unreliable. But you had uh, you had uh, pods in, in a couple of your missile wells. Uh, I don't remember ever having that condition as lead. No, no. Uh, in fact, as lead, we, we did not have that condition. The lead airplanes would always fly with the full load, and the jamming pods would sit not in the missile wells, in the wing stations, but in the wing stations underneath the side wings. But you know, there's a, uh, in, uh, in retrospect, when you look at the whole conflict for, for many months, at least half of my tour, it was a bombing effort. And so the missiles that were on the aircraft usually stayed on the aircraft. And I, I mentioned this fact about having internal vigilance, you know. Well, if you don't use a system over a period of time, and, uh, and that, that doesn't become a priority mission, that gets to be put on the side and you concentrate on other weapon systems that you're using. So in the initial days when we started going over the north again, when we fired uh, missiles, as uh, General Richard mentioned, we had a very good success rate until that became the, uh, the mode and the, the weapon of choice. And then people became more familiar, more experienced. Now there's a great learning curve, and that's kind of the danger, and I'm all for peace, of, of this attitude that sometimes we have where we, uh, we kind of forget the military and the police until we need them. But uh, unless you keep systems up and you keep, uh, you keep modernizing, then when you really need it, you're going to have an attrition rate in a, in a conflict before you finally get up to speed and gain the experience and have your weapon systems working with the air crew and, and everyone else to, to finally achieve what you want. So there was a learning curve there and, uh, and a, a an equipment problem initially. The missiles that we had, at the first part of the war, were not maintained very well. When we got into going into North Vietnam on a daily basis, if we didn't use the missile after 10 rides, because you know, landing it on the runway every day, it's an electronic gadget, so the electronics in it get banged up a little bit. After 10 rides, 10 missions, it would get downloaded from our jet, go over to munitions maintenance, get tweaked up, and get put right back on the same jet. So we used the same missiles until we fired, but they were always tweaked up. And we were careful about not putting any undue, undue G-forces on when we didn't have to. If we had to, we certainly did, and even when we trained. But if we didn't have to put Gs on the missile, we didn't do it. Ellie. Yes, sir, thank you. I'm Ellie Bishop. I'm from the recruiting squadron in Hill Air Force Base, so you'll have to just give me this political announcement. Um, if any of you in the room know any young people that want to become a part of this great team and a wonderful opportunity, incredible experience, we've got 30,000 jobs a year still, so we're not hard to get a hold of. But, sir, I do have a question. Um, a lot of talk in the Air Force today about the composite wing that we're going to, and you mentioned the choppers and the fighters and the tankers and the 130 gunships. Were they all based at the same bases, or were you all flying out at different bases? And if so, <coughs> the composite wing is a, a positive thing, would you rather have seen the composite wing over in Vietnam, or um, did, it, did it work okay what we were doing coming out of different bases? Well, we certainly did have a lot of assets coming out of a lot of different bases, and, uh, and for many reasons. Goodness, we had tankers, we had uh, tankers out of uh, different bases. Wow. Uh, and uh, so, yes, that, that effort uh, did require assets from many different places. Now, uh, I'm in favor of the composite wing, for instance. Uh, in the first tour, I was fortunate enough to fly the first F-4 fast fat mission in Southeast Asia, an outgrowth of the Misties in the 100. And after about a two-month test period, John Blood, who was uh, DO at 7th, 
came up to Da Nang, where we were, where we uh, operated this mission, uh, to get briefed, and, and it had gone very well. And so he wanted to expand the mission. And he said, do you think we should operate the entire mission from here at Da Nang, or should each wing have its own unit? And we felt that it was very important for the, each wing to have the own, their own unit so it could work actually with the other crews, the fighter crews at the wing and the recce crews for wings that had recce crews. We felt it was real important to have those assets at the same location. So that's, that's one of the reasons that the composite wing concept is important. We were very fortunate at Udorn because uh, we were considered a fighter strategic uh, reconnaissance wing, but we did have an RF4 RF unit there. We had a Laredo FAC mission, and then we had the fighter squadrons. And uh, as a result, we uh, worked very, very closely with all of them and, uh, you know, exchanged notes and uh, usually flew the missions with them. So it, uh, it's invaluable when you have that kind of camaraderie and uh, expertise all in the same room. One of the advantages of a composite force, composite wing, is that you can brief face to face instead of a telephone or through message traffic. And when you brief face to face, you understand who you're flying with. You understand the different pressures that they're going to be going on because they'll have different missions, or different particular missions inside the big package. And you can relay what you need, what your desires are, what you have to have. It makes for a better, tighter force structure, I think. They could appreciate us too, because if you've ever known the mission of a reconnaissance aircraft, they're not really fully loaded with a lot of things hanging from the plane. So we used to have a mission, a uh, post strike mission called Run for the Roses. And that's when a reconnaissance aircraft has to go off and do a post strike uh, uh, photo reconnaissance of the uh, damage that you supposedly obtained. Well, we'd have to escort them. And it was more of a, a chase because they were so clean and so fast, and we were loaded with our weapons that. Uh, uh, we'd see them coming into the target and try to keep track of them while they're doing their thing because they're going to speed and heat. They're not armed. They wouldn't they're not anxious to stick around. <laughs> they're not going to do much loitering, let's put it that way. And then we're there with the missiles to defend them, and it became quite a challenge to keep up with them because usually you ran out of gas before they did. Along that line, Ellie, uh, on the 8th of July, 72, I mentioned earlier this mission where we were lucky enough to get the two MiGs in a minute and a half. That wouldn't have happened without the kind of commu communication that we're talking about that, that uh, is it, it, better if you have a composite force. For example, uh, we worked with Red Crown and Disco. Red Crown is the Navy ship off the coast that was mentioned. Disco was the old Air Force 121 uh, College I, which was the forerunner of AWACS. And they were both providing uh, radar and intelligence information on MIG activity. So every morning before we went to fight, fly, I would call the people. Uh, let's see, uh, Disco was based out of Karat. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, we had flown down and, and uh, met uh, the face to face, as Chuck mentioned, how important that is. I'd flown down and met the uh, people flying that mission and the radar controllers. And every morning I called and talked to them on the secure telephone, briefed them on the mission, my name. Uh, call sign, where we were operating, what the mission would be. So on the 8th of July, we were about 30 miles southwest of Hanoi. Uh, we had received the heads up call, if you remember, which meant they had us in sight and they were clear to fire. There were two MiGs, two MiG-21s, they had us in sight and they were clear to fire. We didn't have them in sight yet. So you can imagine that really gets your attention. We would really begin to look around. Now in a high threat area, we wouldn't fly more than about 8 to 10 seconds without maneuvering. In, in straight and level. So we had rolled out on a heading of east, and uh, there was all this radio chatter going on. Now, rather than going through the normal radio procedure, which would our call sign was Paula, say Paula 01, this is Disco 23, you have Blue Bandits uh, bearing 350, come left to a heading of 295. Rather than doing that, which would have probably taken too much time, uh, the disco controller with whom I had talked that morning on the telephone, he knew, knew my name and call sign and everything. He said, Steve, the two miles north of me. <laughs> and, and out of all, I just happened to pick it up. Steve made an immediate left turn to heading of north, May 21 to 10 o'clock. And see, if I'd have stayed on that easterly heading, just a few more seconds, the timing was so perfect that those two minutes would have probably been in position. We probably wouldn't have seen them. We might not be here telling you the story today. 
So it was that call from a radar controller over a hundred miles away in a, in a 121 orbiting that made the difference that day. And that's that that face to face, that personal communication. That's that's why it is so vitally important. The voice recognition instead of a call sign, just a name, or just a bit too much. Just the voice. Uh, the Navy on Red Ground had some very special people doing the same thing. Uh, one of them was Chief Knowles. He had more. I think he had eight kills to his credit as a GCI controller, and he was the same type of guy. When you talked, you listened. He made sure when he talked, he was worth listening to. So along that line, did you always, were you always crew together, the same way though, um, or did you try to do that? You said you knew what his clearing his throat meant. Did you always try to crew together? Great effort to do that. Chuck and I flew over 100 sorties together, and we, we really, he knew what I needed, I knew what he needed. On that 8th of July mission, about all that was said during that minute and a half was it's a good lock, it's a good lock. Uh, Chuck, I needed Chuck to confirm the lock on uh, that, I, that I'd achieved on those two minutes. And it was very important that we wait four seconds. Right. <laughs> very important. Because it takes, from the lock on, it takes the radar two seconds to settle out and have good data. It takes another two seconds for the missile to accept the data and have good data when it launches. If you wait three and a half seconds, you've got a stupid missile. It'll still fire, but it, it won't guide. In an airplane like the F-4 that's built for two people, there's a great advantage to having two people in the airplane under two conditions, in my opinion. Number one, that both people are qualified, well qualified. And number two, that you can fly together as a team all the time. And same with a flight of four. We tried, to, we tried as much as we could to fly the same people in the flight of four as much as we possibly could. But uh, certainly the same crew. Another advantage that we had at Udalanga is that we, uh, under General uh, Gabriel's uh, leadership, we had a policy of uh, silent running. And we're talking about frustrating a lot of people in, in different places that weren't a part of your wing. Uh, we're one of the few wings that could uh, perform a mission without uh, very much radio chatter at all. So from the time that uh, we strapped into the cockpit to the time we landed, uh, very little comments were made outside. There. And when you could hear the the noise and the screams and the, the chatter from everyone else, it was a blessing to have quiet because then you could concentrate on what you were doing. But that only comes with the development of trust among uh, uh, professionals. How frequent was it that you would get some pylon boats to go after to change your mission? Would that happen very often when you had ground, ground weapons and had to deliver and had to go on air to air? Well, in the air-to-air -air role, which we were flying most of the time, we weren't carrying uh, air ground loads. We weren't carrying our gear. The standard load, uh, particularly for the lead airplane and, and three, and then later on for all four airplanes, four AIM-7s, four AIM-9s. And then if you were in an E-model, of course, they had the gun. But so we carried center line tank and two wing tanks. We would jettison the center line tank inbound every time. We'd take off, go to the tanker, top off. Inbound when the centerline tank was empty, we jettisoned centerline tank, and then we'd maintain the wing tanks until we got into a situation where we needed all the maneuverability we could get, and we'd blow the wing tanks no matter how much gas they had in them. Normally the night before you had a uh, mission that came down from, uh, in this case, from Saigon, uh, where they, they designated certain air uh, missions for air to air, and then we had certain uh, groups of people that were down there. So. Uh, they could try to configure and keep those aircraft in the same configuration rather than uh, loading and uh, downloading suspension here. Because that just puts more uh, uh, stress and wear on that equipment and the checks that, that take. And, uh, uh, so we learned early on in the war that you try to dedicate aircraft and crews to a particular mission where they can become professionals. And because the Air 4 was a jack of all trades. And uh, I'm not saying it was a master of none, but it. Uh, if you try to go from one mission to another using the various systems, it just takes more uh, time and effort to keep them all on. So speaking of radar fair to ground, it's just different than speaking of fair to air. Yeah. You just don't so have the time to by doing this. In fact, we flew the same airplane most of the time. Uh, and we could follow the airplane day to day. And when it wasn't center spec for whatever the system was, I could, I could write it up and get it fixed. Even though it was in specs, it wasn't center spec, and it was drifting off. 
and we understood the airplane. And we were, you know, it's, it's not, you weren't fighting the man, you weren't fighting the machine. You were fighting the man in the machine. You know, knowing your system and knowing his system and how he thinks about it is extremely important. Airplanes are like Rolls Royces. Each one, although they're built on assembly line, they're, you know, they're individuals and they all have their own character. You know, try to humanize it a little bit. Uh, you could go out to your tail number and you said, no, that dog, because it's flying differently, you know? <laughs> it, uh, or I said, that's a fast machine. Or, you know, uh, just just something about it's it. It's amazing. Know? And you'd, you'd smile when you talk to a tail number, and you swore that that plane would smile back. Because uh, you had that relationship. <laughs> right. In other places, it's not about that. People would get us up there back. A three-digit tail number. Triple three, or triple three. You know, it's, it picks up, you know. <laughs> and it's stayed for personalities. The 463 out of the, what, seven that we had at Udorn that had the APX-81, we felt 463 was the best. It was matched. And, uh, we, luckily, we were able to select that airplane after a certain period of time and fly it uh, almost every day. In your own words, sir, would you please uh, maybe explain to us, paint a picture for us on that mission that day? Which, which one? Well, pick, pick your bagel. <laughs> Well, John, what's your favorite? Well, probably, probably not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you want to <laughs> uh, Should you watch? Uh, the one that kind of has drawn us all together, if you will, in uh, in this little moment in history, where it was that mission on the 10th of May. Uh, there were tremendous highs, very briefly, and then some uh, tremendous uh, low feelings because of the loss of uh, the lead airplane. Uh, but during that particular mission, Steve Eves and I had four MiGs, one MiG-21, which we got, and three MiG-19s, clearly within two to 3,000 feet of us, that we had a position of advantage on, and one uh, less than optimum missile left. And, uh, so from a, an opportunity and a high, there were people that went over there three and four times just trying to be airborne on the same day that the big was airborne. In a matter of five minutes, I had four guys clearly in front of me. Uh, yeah, but with no, uh, with no real capability after the first one. Uh, so there was a real tremendous rush, a high, but uh, uh, the disappointment of, of losing one of our airplanes Really Sad lesson in that uh, that mission, John. Uh, Bob Lodge and, and Roger Locker in the lead airplane. Uh, Bob's a classmate of mine, and had actually been a student of mine at the weapons school in, uh, at Nellis before he came over, and then I came over later. He was on his third tour, so it was uh, Roger Locker. They were clearly recognized as the leading crew in Southeast Asia. Um, and they had two MiGs prior to this mission. And uh, down the third, early part of this mission. And during the battle, they were going after their fourth MiG. MiG was out in front of them. And even a crew that was that experienced, had that many combat missions, uh, was overcome with what we call target fixation. And that fourth MiG that would have been theirs second for the day, it was out in front of them, commanded all of their attention, and they did not hear the radio calls that we were making, that uh, there were MiG-19s attacking them, to break, to break, and under attack. They were so concentrated on that target out in front of them that they just didn't pay attention to the rear quarter. And it's amazing that a crew with that much experience, and that would that widely recognized, and they were that good, but it could happen, it could happen. And that's a lesson, I think, for all of us, that uh, no matter how good you are and how much experience you have, it's, it's possible for a problem to come up and bite you. Did you expend all of your munitions on every sortie? No, in fact, uh, we, we never fired unless, unless we uh, had a good shot at a target. Now, in, in you know, we have, we've all flown a lot of different types of missions uh, uh, 
you know, support missions, strike missions, that sort of thing. But our main job at UDARN during this period in 1972 was MIG-CAP, Combat Air Patrol. We flew in flights of four out ahead of and to the side and to the rear of the strike force in order to protect them from MIG attack. And our job was not really to shoot down MIGs. Our job was to protect the strike force and the wrecking force. So it wasn't necessarily that we would run off chasing MIGs. We had to stay in position to protect the force. The name of the game was to protect the force, get the pictures, and then shoot down MIGs. So no, we didn't. You know, we didn't fire unless we had a good shot. What was kind of unique of that day was because uh, there were so many ground aboards from other flight members that were supposed to be securing other uh, areas uh, up there in the cap that we ended up having to extend ourselves over a bigger area uh, against the, that same uh, uh, enemy force and uh, take the position of the, the greater flying area that was supposed to be accommodated by other people. I've been asked uh, in the past, how much time did I spend in the radar? And how much time did I spend looking out? How much time did I spend navigating? And I probably spent about 90% of my time in the radar, 90% of my time looking out, <laughs> well, not quite that much navigating. Uh, and say, well, how can you do that? Well, we have computers that are starting to match the human mind now that are interleaved and they can do two, three things at one time. And you know, that, you did what you had to do. The mission drove your actions, and knowing what was required from the team concept, I made sure that if we needed information, we had it. <coughs> Whether it was where we were, what was in the radar, what interpreting the radar. Uh, now you usually used a bullseye map of North Vietnam on your radar scope. So there was a direct link of information there. Because once the pilot, whether it's a single-seat airplane or a multi or a two-seat airplane, once the pilot gets locked on eyeball-wise to that target, he never wants to take his eyes off of it. Because the minute you blink, the minute you take your eyes off to look in and look back out, it makes disappear, guaranteed. So once we got a visual on the target, then Steve never looked inside. I hate to cut this off, but I think we've been here an hour and a half, and uh, what I'd like to do is to give you a chance to take a bathroom break and then have these four gentlemen go out by the F-4 and the MiG and maybe talk a little bit about them there on a, a level that's still different from here. And we'd sure like to have the opportunity to sign any of these if anybody would, uh, would like to be delighted to do that. Well, I don't know about you, but I, I've been fascinated for an hour and a half, and uh, I just appreciate you coming. We have a little, uh, little memento for you that uh, <coughs> we give our guests that uh, you. come and visit with us. And so if you'd like to break now, and uh, maybe get autographs or go to the bathroom and meet the hot man in the gallery.